Well, hello one more time today. Um, I have picked up my book, Irish Fairy Tales. And uh, I have never read any of these before. But they just, it just seemed like it'd be fun to go through. And I was going to like just scan through the, the titles and see if I found one that I liked. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to start with the first one. So we'll see how it goes. This one is Princess Finola and the Dwarf. A long, long time ago, there lived in a little hut in the midst of a bare, brown, lonely moor, an old woman and a young girl. The old woman was withered, sour-tempered, and dumb. The young girl was as sweet and as fresh as an opening rosebud, and her voice was as musical as the whisper of a stream in the woods in the hot days of summer. The little hut, made of branches woven closely together, was shaped like a beehive. In the center of the hut, a fire burned night and day from year's end to year's end, though it was never touched or tended by human hand. In the cold days and nights of winter, it gave out light and heat that made the hut cozy and warm. But in the summer nights and days, it gave out light only. So it's a magic fire. With their heads to the wall of the hut and their feet towards the fire were two sleeping couches, one of plain woodswork in which slept the old woman, the other was Finola's. It was of bog oak, polished as a looking glass, and on it were carved flowers and birds of all kinds that gleamed and shone in the light of the fire. This couch was fit for a princess, and a princess Finola was, though she did not know it herself. Outside the hut, the bare, brown, lonely moor stretched for miles on every side, but towards the east it was bounded by a range of mountains that looked to Finola blue in the daytime, but which put on a hundred changing colors as the sun went down. Nowhere was a house to be seen, nor a tree, nor a flower, nor sign of any living thing. From morning till night, nor hum a bee, nor song a bird, nor voice of man, nor any sound fell on Finola's ear. When the storm was in the air, the great waves thundered on the shore beyond the mountains, and the wind shouted in the glens, but when it sped across the moor, it lost its voice, and passed as silently as the dead. At first the silence frightened Finola, but she got used to it after a time, and often broke it by talking to herself and singing. The only other person beside the old woman Finola ever saw was a dumb dwarf who, mounted on a broken-down horse, came once a month to the hut, bringing with him a sack of corn for the old woman and Finola. Although he couldn't speak to her, Finola was always glad to see the dwarf and his old horse, and she used to give them cake made with her own white hands. As for the dwarf, he would have died for the little princess. He was so much in love with her, and often and often his heart was heavy and sad, as he thought of her pining away in the lonely moor. It chanced that he came one day, and she did not, as usual, come out to greet him. He made signs to the old woman, but she took up a stick and struck him, and beat his horse and drove him away. But as he was leaving, he caught a glimpse of Finola at the door of the hut and saw that she was crying. This sight made him so very miserable that he could think of nothing else but her sad face that he had always seen so bright, and he allowed the old horse to go on without, mind, without minding where he was going. Suddenly, he heard a voice saying, It is time for you to come. The dwarf looked, and right before him, at the foot of a green hill, was a little man, not half as big as, as himself, dressed in a green jacket with brass buttons and a red cap and tassel. It is time for you to come, he said the second time, but you are welcome anyhow. Get off your horse and come in with me, that I may touch your lips with a wand of speech, that we may have a talk together. The dwarf got off his horse and followed the little man through a hole in the side of a green hill. The hole was so small that he had to go on his hands and knees to pass through it, and when he was able to stand, he was only the same height as the little ferryman. After walking three or four steps, they were in a splendid room, as bright as day. Diamonds sparkled in the roof as stars sparkle in the sky when the night is without a cloud. The roof rested on golden pillars, and between the pillars were sil silver lamps, but their light was dimmed by that of the diamonds. In the middle of the room was a table, on which were two golden plates and two silver knives and forks, 
and a brass bell as big as a hazelnut. And beside the table were two little chairs covered with blue silk and satin. Take a chair, said the fairy, and I will ring for the wand of speech. The dwarf sat down, and the fairy man rang the little brass bell, and in came a little weeny dwarf no bigger than your hand. <laughs> a little weeny dwarf. Bring me the wand of speech, said the fairy, and the weenie dwarf bowed three times and walked out backwards, and in a minute he returned, carrying a little black wand with a red berry at the top of it, and giving it to the fairy, he bowed three times and walked out backwards as he had done before. The little man waved the rod three times over the dwarf, and struck him once on the right shoulder and once on the left shoulder, and then touched his lips with the red berry and said, Speak. The dwarf spoke. And he was so rejoiced at hearing the sound of his own voice that he danced about the room. "'Who are you at all, at all?' said he to the fairy. "'Who is yourself?' said the fairy. "'But come, before we have any talk, let us have something to eat, for I am sure you are hungry.' Then they sat down to the table, and the fairy rang the little brass bell twice, and the weenie dwarf brought in two boiled snails in their shells. And when they had eaten the snails, he brought in a a dormouse, and when they had eaten the dorm dormouse, he brought in two wrens, and when they had eaten the wrens, he brought in two nuts full of wine, and they became very merry, and the ferryman sang, Kulin Das, and the dwarf sang, The Little Black Bird of the Glen. Did you ever hear the foggy dew, said the fairy? No, said the dwarf. Well then, I'll give it to you but we must have some more wine. And the wine was brought, and he sang the foggy dew, and the dwarf said it was the sweetest song he had ever heard, and that the ferryman's voice would coax the birds off the bushes. You asked me who I am, said the fairy. I did, said the dwarf. And I asked you who is yourself. You did, said the dwarf. And who are you then? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know, said the dwarf, and he blushed like a rose. Well, tell me what you know about yourself. Sorry, I feel like I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> Whew, sorry. Okay, he said, well, tell me what you know about yourself. I remember nothing at all, said the dwarf, before the day I found myself going along with a crowd of all sorts of people to the great fair of the Liffey. Liffey, Liffey, L-I-F-F-E-Y, and L is capitalized. We had to pass by the king's palace on our way, and as we were passing the king, as we were passing, the king sent for a band of jugglers to come and show their tricks before him. I followed the jugglers to look on, and when the play was over, the king called me to him and asked me who I was and where I came from. I was dumb then and couldn't answer. But even if I could speak, I could not tell him what he wanted to know, for I remember nothing of myself before that day. Then the king asked the jugglers, but they knew nothing about me, and no one knew anything. And then the king said he would take me into his service, and the only work I have to do is go once a month with a bag of corn to the hut in the lonely moor. And there you fell in love with a little princess, said the fairy, winking at the dwarf. The poor dwarf blushed twice as much as he had done before. You need not blush, said the fairy. It is a good man's case. And now tell me, truly, do you love the princess? And what would you give to free her from the spell of enchantment that is over her? I would give my life, said the dwarf. Well then, listen to me, said the fairy. The princess Finola was banished to the lonely moor by the king, your master. He killed her father, who was the rightful king, and would have killed Finola, only he was told by an old sorceress that if he killed her, he would die himself on the same day, and she advised him to banish her to the lonely moor, and she said she would fling a spell of enchantment over it, and that until the spell was broken, Finola could not leave the moor. And the sorceress also promised that she would send an old woman to watch over the princess by day and by night, so that no harm should come to her. But she told the king that he himself should select a messenger to take food to the hut, and that he should look out for someone who had never seen or heard the princess, and whom he could trust never to tell anyone anything about her, 
and that is the reason he selected you. Since you know so much, said the dwarf, can you tell me who I am or where I came from? You will know that time enough, said the fairy. I have given you back your speech. It will depend solely on yourself whether you will get back your memory of who and what you were before the day you entered the king's service. But are you really willing to try and break the spell of enchantment and free the princess? I am, said the dwarf. Whatever it will cost you? Yes, if it costs me my life, said the dwarf. But tell me, how can the spell be broken? Oh, it is easy enough to break the spell if you have the weapons, said the fairy. And what are they? And where are they? said the dwarf. The spear of the shining haft, and the dark blue blade, and the silver shield, said the fairy. They are on the farther bank of the mystic lake, in the island of the western seas. They are there for the man who is bold enough to seek them. If you are the man who will bring them back to the lonely moor, you will only have to strike the shield three times with the haft, and three times with the blade of the spear, and the silence of the moor will be broken forever. The spell of enchantment will be removed, and the princess will be free. I will set out at once, said the dwarf, jumping from his chair. And whatever it costs you, said the fairy, will you pay the price? I will, said the dwarf. Well then, mount your horse, give him his head, and he will take you to the shore opposite the island of the Mystic Lake. Maybe his heed, he, head, I don't know, heading, like direction, head. Oh well. Um, <clears throat> you must cross to the island on his back and make your way through the water steeds that swim around the island night and day to guard it. But woe betide you if you attempt to cross without paying the price. For if you do, the angry water steeds will rend you and your horse to pieces. And when you come to the mystic lake, you must wait until the waters are as red as wine, and then swim your horse across it, and on the farther side you will find the spear and shield. But woe betide you if you attempt to cross the lake before you pay the price. For if you do, the black cormorants of the western seas will pick your flesh from your bones. What is the price? said the dwarf. You will know that time enough, said the fairy. But now go, and good luck, and good luck go with you. The dwarf thanked the fairy and said goodbye. He then threw the reins of his horse's neck and started up the hill. That seemed to grow bigger and bigger as he ascended, and the dwarf soon found that what he took for a hill was a great mountain. After traveling all the day, twirling up by his steep crags and heathery passes, he reached the top as the sun was setting in the ocean, and he saw far below him out in the waters the island of the Mystic Lake. He began his descent to the shore, but long before he reached it the sun had set, and darkness, unpierced by a single star, dropped upon the sea. The old horse, worn out by his long and painful journey, sank beneath him, and the dwarf was so tired that he rolled off his back and fell asleep by his side. He awoke at the breaking of the morning and saw that he was almost at the water's edge. He looked out to the sea and saw the island, but nowhere could he see the water steeds, and he began to fear he must have taken a wrong course in the night and that the island before him was not the one he was in search of. But even while he was so thinking, he heard fierce and angry snortings, and, coming swiftly from the island to the shore, he saw the swimming and prancing steeds. Sometimes their heads and manes only were visible, and sometimes, rearing, they rose half out of the water, and, striking it with their hooves, churned it into a foam and tossed the white spray to the skies. As they approached nearer and nearer, their snortings became more terrible, and their nostrils shot forth clouds of vapor. The dwarf trembled at the sight and sound, and his old horse, quivering in every limb, moaned piteously, as if in pain. On came the steeds, until they almost touched the shore, then, rearing, they seemed about to spring onto it. The frightened dwarf turned his head to fly, and as he did so, he heard the twang of a golden harp, and right before him, who stood he but the little man of the hills, holding a harp in one hand and striking the strings with the other. Are you ready to pay the price? said he, nodding gaily to the dwarf. As he asked the question, the listening water steeds snorted more furiously than ever. 
Are you ready to pay the price? said the little man a second time. A shower of spray, tossed on shore by the angry steeds, drenched the dwarf to the skin and sent a cold shiver to his bones, and he was so terrified that he could not answer. For the third and last time, are you ready to pay the price? asked the fairy, as he flung the harp behind him and turned to depart. When the dwarf saw him going, he thought of the little princess and the lonely moor, and his courage came back, and he answered bravely, Yes, I am ready. The water steeds, hearing his answer and snorting with rage, struck the shore with their pounding hoofs. Back to your waves, cried the little harper, and as he ran his fingers across his lyre, the frightened steeds drew back into the waters. What is the price? asked the dwarf. Your right eye, said the fairy, and before the dwarf could say a word, the fairy scooped out the eye with his finger and put it into his pocket. The dwarf suffered most terrible agony, but he resolved to bear it for the sake of the little princess. Then the fairy sat down on a rock at the edge of the sea, and after striking a few notes, he began to play the strains of slumber. The sound crept along the waters, and the steeds, so ferocious a moment before, became perfectly still. They had no longer any motion of their own, and they floated on the top of the tide like foam before a breeze. Now, said the fairy as he led the dwarf's horse to the edge of the tide. The dwarf urged the horse into the water, and once out of his depths, the old horse struck out boldly for the island. The sleeping water steeds drifted helplessly against him, and in a short time he reached the island safely, and he neighed joyously as his hoofs touched solid ground. The dwarf rode on and on until he came to a bridle path, and following this, it led him up through winding lanes, bordered with golden firs that filled the air with fragrance, and brought him to the summit of the green hills that girdled, girdled and looked down on the mystic lake. Here, the horse stopped of his own accord, and the dwarf's heart beat, qu beat quickly as his eye rested on the lake that, clipped around the ring of the hills, seemed in the breezeless and sunlit air as still as death and as bright as life can be. After gazing at it for a long time, he dismounted and laid his ease in the pleasant grass. Hour after hour passed, but no change came over the face of the waters, and when the night fell, and when the night fell sleep closed the eyelids of the dwarf. The song of the lark awoke him in the early morning, and starting up, he looked at the lake, but its waters were as bright as they had been the day before. Towards midday, he beheld what he thought was a black cloud sailing across the sky from east to west. It seemed to grow larger as it came nearer and nearer, and when its wings darkened the waters of the lake, and the dwarf knew it was one of the cormorants of the western seas. As it descended slowly, he saw that it held in one of its claws a branch of a tree larger than a full-grown oak, and laden with clusters of ripe red berries. It alighted at some distance from the dwarf, and, after resting for a time, it began to eat the berries and to throw the stones into the, into the lake, and wherever a stone fell, a bright red stain appeared in the water. As he looked more closely at the bird, the dwarf saw that it had all the signs of old age, and he could not help wondering how it was able to carry such a heavy tree. Later in the day, two other birds, as large as the first, but younger, came up from the west and settled down beside him. They also ate the berries, and throwing the stones into the lake, it was soon as red as wine. When they had eaten all the berries, the young birds began to pick the decayed feathers off the old bird and to smooth his plumage. As soon as they had completed their task, he rose slowly from the hill and sailed out over the lake, and dropping down on the waters, dived beneath them. In a moment, he came to the surface and shot up into the air with a joyous cry and flew off to the west in all the vigor of renewed youth, followed by the other birds. When they had gone so far that they were like specks in the sky, the dwarf mounted his horse and descended toward the lake. He was almost at the margin and in another minute would have plunged in when he heard a fierce screaming in the air. And before he had time to look up, the three birds were hovering over the lake. The dwarf drew back frightened. 
The birds wheeled over his head, and then, swooping down, they flew close to the water, covering it with their wings and uttering harsh cries. Then, rising to a great height, they folded their wings and dropped headlong, like three rocks, on the lake, crashing its surface and scattering a wine-red shower upon the hills. Then the dwarf remembered what the fairy told him, that if he attempted to swim the lake without paying the price, the three cormorants of the western seas would pick the flesh off his bones. He knew not what to do, and was about to turn away, when he heard once more the twang of the golden harp, and the little fairy of the hill stood before him. Faint heart never won, fair lady, said the little harper. Are you ready to pay the price? The spear and shield are on the opposite bank, and the princess Finola is crying this moment in the lonely moor. At the mention of Finola's name, the dwarf's heart grew strong. Yes, he said, I am ready, win or die. What is the price? Your left eye, said the fairy, and as soon as he said, he scooped out the eye, and he put it in his pocket. The poor blind dwarf almost fainted with pain. It's your last trial, said the fairy, and now do what I tell you. Twist your horse's mane round your right hand, and I will lead him to the water. Plunge in, and fear not. I gave you back your speech. When you reach the opposite bank, you will get back your memory, and you will know who and what you are. Then the fairy led the horse to the margin of the lake. In with you now, and good luck go with you, said the fairy. The dwarf urged the horse. He plunged into the lake and went down and down until his feet struck the bottom. <clears throat> then he began to ascend, and he came near the surface of the water the dwarf thought he shot. Then he began to ascend, and as he came near the surface of the water, the dwarf thought he saw a glimmering light, and when he rose above the water, he saw the bright sun shining and the green hills before him, and he shouted with joy at finding his sight restored. But he saw more. Instead of the old horse he had ridden into the lake, he was bestride a noble steed. And as the steed swam to the bank, the dwarf felt a change coming over himself, and an unknown vigor in his limbs. When the steed touched the shore, he galloped up the hillside, and on the top of the hill was a silver shield, bright as the sun, resting against a spear standing upright in the ground. The dwarf jumped off, and running towards the shield, he saw himself as in a looking glass. He was no longer a dwarf, but a gallant knight. At that moment his memory came back to him, and he knew he was Konal, one of the knights of the Red Branch, and he remembered now that the spell of dumbness and deformity had been cast upon him by the witch of the palace of the Quicken Trees. Slinging his shield upon his left arm, he plucked the spear from the ground and leapt onto his horse. With a light heart he swam back over the lake, and nowhere could he see the black cormorants of the western seas but three white swans floating abreast following him to the bank. When he reached the bank, he galloped down to the sea and crossed to the shore. Then he flung the reins upon his horse's neck, and swifter than the wind, the gallant horse swept on and on, and it was not long until he was bounding over the enchanted moor. Wherever his hoofs struck the ground, grass and flowers sprang up, and great trees with leafy branches rose on every side. At last the knight reached the little hut. Three times he struck the shield with the haft and three times with the blade of a spear. At the last blow the hut disappeared, and standing before him was the little princess. The knight took her in his arms and kissed her. Then he lifted her onto the horse, and, leaping up before her, he turned towards the north, to the palace of the Red Branch Knights, and as they rode on beneath the leafy trees from every tree, in, from every tree the birds sang out, for the spell of silence over the lonely moor was broken forever. It wasn't bad. Um, it only took about 24 minutes to read through. That's not bad at all. Um, I don't know how often we'll we'll go through one of these, but I enjoyed that. I like the old stories. Uh, you get a, a dose of different cultures. And uh, this one is fairy tales. Some of the books I got are uh, myths and legends. And... You know, obviously that's going to have some culture stuff in it. And you're going to have some religious stuff. So, uh, like I've got one, it's uh, Viking. Um, so you're going to have probably some Norse mythology mixed in there. Uh, while obviously I don't believe it, it is interesting to read through. 
And it's also interesting is some of these that have um, myths and legends about early times and creation and, and whatnot, um, you will see where there are stories that I, I can't tell if like you got Christians, I'm saying Christian, like from the Old Testament, like um, Hebrew stories pulled and, and transformed over time. Or like Paul said, um, God has put it in every man's heart that, you know, I forget exactly how he phrases it, but, you know, God has made himself known to everyone in some kind of way. And so you'll see, like I've, I've read some books that talk about uh, different myths and legends from, from more um, native cultures. And um, you will see like there's some kind of longing for a savior that sacrifices himself for the people. Like that is a common theme. And like there's, there's just a longing for that, it seems like. So while I don't believe the stories they're telling are, are true, it does seem like either they're pulling from that or they're longing for it. And like, th that's a universal desire. So I think it would be neat to go through some of these and, and uh, read through them. Anyway, this video has been long enough, but I will talk to you later. Bye.